Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and the first item on the agenda for this afternoon will be the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have um, a couple of announcements and just some scheduling reminders. Uh, first, I wanted uh, to remind the Board and to announce to the public that per 18 VSA Section 9374, um, the Board has submitted our uh, bill back report to the legislature. Um, this report will be posted under uh, on our website under under legislative reports bill back. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or need any more information, please reach out to me and I can uh, share that with you. In terms of our schedule, I just wanted to remind um, the board and the public about our schedule this week. Uh, we're obviously here today to hear from um, Secretary Smith and others from AHS. Um, and then we, after this um, presentation, we'll take some time for deliberations and potential votes. Then on tomorrow, we're scheduled to come back again together at 8.30 a.m. and really scheduled for the entire day for deliberation and potential hospital budget votes. And then um, tomorrow evening, Wednesday, we have our primary care advisory group me meeting, which takes place from 5 to 7. Um, and then on Thursday, we also have scheduled um, starting at 8.30 uh, deliberations and potential votes on hospital budget starting again, as I said, at 8.30. And then just a, a reminder that next Monday, 9.21, we are holding our Green Mountain Care Board General Advisory Group, and that takes place from 2 to 4. All of the information on how to access these calls is on our website. And again, if you have any questions, please reach out. That is all I have for today. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, September 9th. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 9th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Then we'll move right on in, into the, the business of this afternoon. And um, first we're going to hear from Secretary Smith. And Secretary Smith is going to update us on the state coronavirus relief funding. And uh, um, Mike, will Ina be speaking as well or just you? We can't well, hear can, you, Mike. If I if I can unmute myself, uh, uh, <laughs> Ina and uh, Alicia Cooper will be speaking uh, as well, and so, Alicia, Alicia's on the line here. Great. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. So, um, thank you. I was I was trying to convince Dr. Fauci if he would uh, give this presentation uh, today, but that didn't that didn't pan out. Uh, he did a he did a wonderful job at the press conference, but he wouldn't. Um, he had he said he had something at the White House at two o'clock. So um, let me um, just um, go over what I want to present today, and more most particular, um, really zero in I think on what you're most interested in, and that's the healthcare provider stabilization grant program, and an update on hospital awards um, that will be forthcoming. Um, the the program review that will I'll just go over the overview. We'll do a program review, then we'll have a program update, and the hospital applicants and the awards that we will be uh, sending out, and some considerations that I want to talk about. I want to give a program description because this is only the sort of the first round of a two round process here. Uh, so there may be other rounds that um, uh, there is another round planned of uh, this program, but I wanted to give you an update of where we're coming from. As you know, there was uh, the legislature passed a health care provider stabilization grant program. They appropriated $275 million. It does have some requirements to it. It must be administered to the federal requirements under the CARES Act, 
um, that allows for permissible use. It also uh, has to be needs based in the application process. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and one of the things that was interesting um, that the legislature did, and we promoted actually, was that it should be a broad array of healthcare and human services pro providers who are eligible for the program, uh, spanning uh, self employed practitioners to peer services providers to hospitals. We're going to be focusing on hospitals in this presentation. Uh, but there are um, some, uh, you know, if I look across the spectrum, um, there's there were a lot of applicants in different sort of uh, healthcare environments, uh, I think is the word I want to use. Um, like I had mentioned in the beginning, um, we were going to see how this went in the first round and if we had money. Uh, we were going to have a, a second round. We're going to have money. We're going to we're going to have a second round. Uh, the cycle one application deadline was August 15th, and for the time period uh, for, for revenue lost and expenses for the time period March 1st, 2020 to June 15th of uh, 2020, and then cycle two will be uh, planned for October, and it's for the time period March 1st of 2020 to September 15th. That shouldn't. Um, there, I'll. Um, uh, you know, is that time period right? That time period is not right, is it? For time period March first, twenty twenty. That's time period. That that is the correct time period because while it is a second cycle, if an applicant comes into the process new and hasn't applied for funds yet, their that. need can be met starting March one. Okay, I stand corrected then. Um, conditions for the grant, the grant must be expended before uh, December 30th. As you know, that's the that's the requirement of the CARES Act as of uh, this date. I don't know if Congress is going to extend it or not. They have not been um, too inclined to do anything lately. So we, um, we're going with that everything has to be expended by uh, December 30th. Grant funds will be used to cover costs and lost revenues associated with the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, with COVID-19 disaster. Um, grants are subject to requirements of a single audit and where applicable provider organizations will continue current participation in value-based payment initiatives through 2021 if you accept this grant award. Um, one of the, the application inputs I'm going to turn to um, uh, I'm going to turn to Alicia to sort of explain the application inputs uh, in terms of how what we were looking for as we put these applications together. And Alicia, I'm going to turn to you later on and talk about the application review status as well. But can you just go through the application inputs? Certainly. Uh, so as Secretary Smith noted earlier, uh, we were looking at this as a needs based application process and in order to evaluate needs for the different types of provider organizations that were going to be seeking grant funding, we needed to evaluate a number of different areas. Um, some of these areas related to revenue changes. Uh, we were looking at 2019 as a base year. And then the application period of March 1st through June 15th, 2020, as our comparison period for this application cycle. And so the application collected information from providers about their billed and paid amounts in 2019 and their billed amounts for the corresponding period in 2020. We also collected some information about non claims based revenue. And I think this is mostly relevant for uh, ACO payments that were being delivered directly from One Care Vermont to ACO participating providers uh, for which payers would not necessarily have been uh, issuing fee for service payments. We also captured information about 
gross staff wages and any relevant changes that providers experienced in those wages from 2019 to the grant period of March 1st through June 15th, and information about organizational operating costs. We also collected detail about COVID-19 related expenses uh, in a number of different categories, which we can talk about more in detail later. And then the last category of information that represented an important input was any financial assistance that providers have received to date. This may have included information about federal relief that has already been issued and information about um, grants that providers may have received previously through the Agency of Human Services through some of our earlier provider stabilization efforts. Um, and in some instances, providers had other grant sources that they included in this area as well. So those that's sort of the methodology that we use to go through the grants application. And, and one of the things um, uh, I just want to highlight, um, this was a, this is and was was and is a fairly intensive, um, labor intensive process. We didn't realize, well, we realized that we were gonna have to reconcile, but there was a lot of reconciliation that had to happen in this process about what was submitted and then questions that came up after the submission in terms of getting the documentation that we would need to verify the various, um, the, the various aspects of the application. And just to give you a program update of where we are um, and how we did things, um, we, we had an application uh, portal that was developed by Salesforce and it aligned with, we wanted to make sure that the platform that we were using were, was communicating um, with other platforms throughout state government that were having similar sort of grant programs. So we aligned it, we, we aligned Salesforce with the other CRF uh, grant programs across the agency. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, Ina. Um, whoops. Um, Anyway, um, we also received, uh, there we go, but just right there. Um, we also received, just to give you an idea of how many applications we received, we received 351 applications from eligible providers. Um, we also, 78% uh, 70 of those applications were new to AHF relief and 22% have received prior approval. And now the applications we receive are a broad array of provider types. The largest group, not dollar amount, but just in terms of numbers, were dentists at 27.7%. Um, if you can go on to the application review status, and Alicia, I'm gonna ask you to sort of tell, um, let the board know where we are on things. Certainly. So one of the things that we have been doing is tracking our status uh, as applications have gone through a review process with the Agency of Human Services team. Um, this figure here represents a snapshot from the close of business yesterday. And uh, I'll sort of orient you to the, the different steps that we have that applications could be in. Um, and you'll see that we don't have applications in all of those statuses at this point in time. But we were tracking applications uh, as they were in a pending review status, which meant that none of our reviewers had had the opportunity to look into the application in detail. We also had a first review complete and ready for second review status. Uh, as you can see, all of our applications have been through that first round of review. Um, the next status, which is this gray color, is uh, applications that have gone through two rounds of review by two different reviewers and have been flagged as requiring additional follow-up with the provider that submitted the application. And uh, as the secretary mentioned, uh, because of all of the information that we were collecting from providers, 
Uh, we had inputs in the application itself, and we also had supporting documentation that was supplied to substantiate those inputs. Um, in some instances, we weren't able to reconcile differences between those inputs and the supporting documentation. And so those are primarily those instances where we will need to do some additional follow-up with providers to make sure that we are understanding the application information correctly and making funding determinations using the appropriate information. Um, the next status is uh, applications where we're waiting for that provider input. And so we'll give providers a, a fixed amount of time to provide that input. Um, once that provider input is received, or for any applications that don't require provider follow-up, uh, we have a status that indicates that they're ready for uh, either a third review of that newly submitted information or a final quality control check. Um, you can see that we have approximately 13% of our applications in that status at this point in time. And then the final application status is all reviews complete. And you can see that currently 42% of our applications are in that status. Um, that does include the hospitals uh, that we'll be speaking about shortly, uh, as well as a number of other applications uh, for which documentation and application inputs were matching. And we were able to process those as part of this um, first wave of funding. In, in the first wave of funding, we're getting out um, about 4.4 million in um, what I would call to smaller entities, uh, those that um, were pretty easy to review and, and substantiate their, what I call low risk uh, uh, entities. And that money is, is going out the door real shortly. Um, the next group, Mr. Secretary, uh, what did you say the dollar amount of that was? Four point four million. Four point four. Thank you. Yeah, but it's it is a bunch of small organizations. Um, uh, so it is it, it, the dollar amount may when we go to the next slide in a minute. The dollar amount is uh, small compared to the next dollar amount you're going to see, but to those people it means a lot. And and so we wanted to make sure we could get those out as quickly as possible as we as we move forward. Um, we know the next slide you're going to be very interested in. So we are uh, moving to the next slide, which is the hospital applicants and uh, awards. Um, we had one, two, eight applicants. Maybe um, I just want to make sure because. There is somebody that we have to talk about, um, uh, Porter Medical. It, uh, Alicia, is this eight or nine with Porter? It's nine with Porter. Nine. nine with Porter. We had nine applicants in total. Um, not every hospital applied uh, for funding. Um, I want to talk about Porter um, and just um, uh, there seemed to be some miscommunication with Porter and we are giving them um, some time to submit some additional information uh, that is due uh, Thursday. We will have we will turn it around and have a number for you. If there is in fact an award, we will have a number to you on Friday. Um, the that award, if there is an award, um, we just uh, uh, the the information we're seeking. We've gone back and forth with them. We just need more information uh, to complete that application. But as you can see um, through our application process, the amounts of money that the various applicants will be getting uh, based upon the formula that Alicia had talked about, um, a lot of hospitals got a lot of money uh, through the federal government. Um, as you know, the formula took that into consideration. Um, UVM Medical didn't get as much in, um, in various um, in various uh, federal cycles as other um, 
uh, as other hospitals did in in sort of proportion or per capita basis, I guess is it would be the word. Um, so you can see based upon the formula, the driven formula, what uh, what the various entities will be uh, will be getting in awards. Those awards will be going out. Uh, I think I sign off on them this afternoon at some point, but those those award notifications will be going out um, very, very shortly. Um, Mr. Secretary? Yeah. On the uh, two that are zero, um, those are two that applied, but at the end, um, it just didn't uh, meet the, the qualifications? That's true. That is absolutely okay. true. And is there uh, any way at all that we could get a range on the possibilities for Porter? Um, I'm unsure of the possibilities right now, but as soon as I know, I will let you know. Okay. I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, the, the, um, the two that you mentioned, Copley and Springfield, uh, obviously Springfield um, is in bankruptcy. Um, we are, we are, we do have money in, you, you may or may not know, we do have money in the big bill uh, in the legislature for some money for Springfield Hospital coming we out. We did of see that, but um, you know, that's all general fund and we were just hoping you could find some creative solution for the taxpayers of Vermont to funnel it in a different way. But I, I'm sure you did everything you could. <laughs> I, try, I tried every which way, uh, but it didn't meet the criteria, especially when they're in uh, in their reorganization. It, it just didn't make, meet the criteria. So um, total uh, cycle one hospital awards are 65 million, 65.6 million. Um, and again, um, Porter is still pending, um, and we'll get a number to you in the next few days on on Porter. Very appreciated. Thank you. Is there um, was there anything else, um, Alicia or Ina, I missed or should be saying? I'll I'll move along to the considerations slide, and and we can look there. If, if okay. you'd like. Move to that next slide, Ina. On this particular slide, like University of Vermont Medical Center, um, UVM has uh, different entities, like the medical practice is separated out. Did they apply and were they successful or um, are they lumped into this one here or is this just hospital? I believe I that this is just the hospital. Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, I think this is just the hospital. Okay. Thank you. Um, there are some considerations that you should be aware of as we move forward, and some considerations where more money could be going out the door to hospitals. There's there's another round, um, you know, so that that is some that is something. Um, this was a funding formula and it's needed based. And if you remember, the federal government has provided considerable direct financial relief to healthcare care providers, uh, reducing overall need. Um, a lot of these on the what we were trying to do is maximize the federal dollars. So FEMA is anticipated to cover 75% of new cost expenses due to uh, COVID-19. Therefore, the hospital award amounts include coverage for only 25%. I just want to I just want to caution the board that those FEMA applications have not been approved yet. So if they're rejected, um, we would uh, probably come back under this stabilization program in the second round. Um, the funding formula used a ratio of billed to paid claims uh, in 2019 compared to 2020. Uh, we recognize that uh, calendar year 2019 base period may favor providers differently, but we really needed just to apply a consistent base uh, over the time period. And this financial relief is one time uh, retrospective uh, 
to the eligible periods and, and covers only documented losses and expenses due to COVID-19 in 2020. We didn't look at anything else other than sort of zeroed in on the COVID losses and the, the COVID revenue losses and, and expenses uh, in, in 2020. And we used 2019 as the comparison year. Now I'll so invite- So just a clarifying question, uh, Mr. Secretary, on the FEMA funds, you said that they're not guaranteed, but it, it sounded like um, if they did not receive it from the federal government, they would still be eligible from the state. And so it, it in my mind, it seems like we ought to be able to count those dollars as we're calculating the financial position of the hospitals. Is that correct? I would say in the major in, in many of the cases, that would be the case. Um, I'm I'm just not sure whether the FEMA eligibility transfers directly, but I I would say that in most cases that would be correct. Thank you. And I I don't have people in the room that can kick me in the shins when I'm wrong anymore. So I will ask uh, Alicia and uh, Ina to speak up if there's something I'm saying that's wrong. Hearing none, it was a 50-50 proposition and I must have guessed <laughs> right. So, uh, Mr. Chair, um, we will get the Porter number to you as quick as possible. Um, we, um, I, I think both Porter and, I, and us were surprised on that and we'll, we'll, we're scrambling to make sure that you get the number as quick as possible. We appreciate that very much. And uh, let me just say that it's very exciting for Vermont to have had um, Dr. Anthony Fauci um, participate in your earlier press conference. And it speaks volumes for the work that you, Commissioner Levine, the governor, and everybody on Team Vermont is doing. And um, you know, just keep up the good work and keep us safe. <laughs> I'd like some sleep one of these days. <laughs> um, do you, uh, how do you want to handle this? Uh, I'd, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions from the board first and then public comment, if it, that's okay with you. It's fine with me. Okay, I'll go in alphabetical order, starting with um, Jessica Holmes. Jess? Hello, Secretary Smith, how are you? I am fine, thank you. You look well for somebody who hasn't slept in six months. I will say that. <laughs> um, I, I do have a couple quick questions. Um, of the 275 million, how much has been allocated already? I know we have 65 million for hospitals. I'm wondering for the other providers. I, I think that was on one of the slides. Maybe I can go back. With, is that no, right? Is that one of the slides? The, the, the money out the door. Money out the door shortly will be this amount plus the 4.4 oh, okay. uh, and and I would say we're over $100 million and probably uh, a, roughly, don't quote me to that, but we're roughly over $100 million for the first phase. Okay, that's great. And then I'm just, I am curious a little bit about the second cycle and whether the, the rules will change. I know some of them are federally mandated, but I'm wondering whether or not you're expecting a different allocation mechanism internally within the state and or a different set of applicants, repeat applicants. I'm just sort of wondering how you're thinking about the second cycle, yeah. how it be different. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of difference. And Alicia, Nina, please, um, you, you've been in the trenches on this, but I don't think there's gonna be a lot of difference. There may be some tweaking along the way, um, but, I don't, I don't, I don't foresee a lot of difference. The second thing is, um, I think we're going to have some repeat applicants. I think we're going to probably have some hospitals that didn't apply in the first round come through. I mean, you got to think about this. The hospitals were a lot was thrown at them all at once. You know, the stabilization, the the budgets, you know, the the federal uh, things that were happening as well. So. Um, we have heard that at least one hospital is going to apply in the second in in the second round. That whether they do or not, that's that that is up to them. Um, I also think that 
you know, there are some hospitals here where they're still bleeding some expenses. Um, al although our system is still up and running, they are still bleeding some expenses. And I expect maybe they come back in and take advantage of of some losses that in that next time period that they, they have, that extended time period. Um, did I miss anything, Ina or Alicia? I think that's I think that's right. I think you captured also what is a very small pattern that we saw with our first round of stabilization back in the spring and that we saw um, some return applicants, but also quite a lot of new applicants in this next um, in this current cycle that we're administering. Is there any concern that if the second round is in October, but it has to be expended by the end of December, that that time period is so short? Is there any concern about that short window to expend whatever stabilization funds are allocated in the second cycle? Not, um, not with this program in particular, okay. because it's retrospective. We're 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 reimbursing them for expenses and revenue loss in the rear view, rear view mirror. We have, we have to verify all this. So that's, that's what we're doing. Um, so I think generally, I don't think that's a concern. Okay, great. Um, and then the FEMA awards, uh, do we know when they're gonna be announced? Is that- I don't, I don't know. And, you know, um, okay. I'm just thinking the window is closing, right? And if those yeah. FEMA awards aren't announced and there's an opportunity for hospitals or others to apply for this program before having heard whether they have FEMA, just worried about the window. But yeah, I will I will say this. We are internally talking about how much we reserve for FEMA if if there are and we're breaking it down into probably we're working with a DPS or we will be working with DPS to break it down in what probably we funded, what is medium risk and what is high risk. And we'll, we'll figure out a, a pot of money from there. Great. And my last question, just I don't want to waste too much time, but the, the, uh, the stipulation that there was current participation in value-based programs uh, or payment, uh, is that maintaining the current level of participation or any participation? So if, they, if a hospital, for example, was in three programs, but drop down to say one, are they still eligible for this funding? How does that work? In my mind, it works that you stay with the current participation that you have. Okay, great. And that will be true in the second cycle? It of will funding? be. Yeah. Okay, thank you, very thank helpful. You. Yeah. Okay, we'll move to uh, Robin, Robin Lunch. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Jess asked all of my questions, so I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thanks. You two are efficient. <laughs> <laughs> we often okay. have a Vulcan mind meld going on. So there you go. Oh. So next, we're going to move to uh, Member Pelham. Tom. Uh, Jess beat me uh, to the mall as well, except for one. Um, I'm just wondering how independent providers fared in this process, so given that a lot of them don't have you know, backup of a large institution and staff to kind of prepare, which what I sense would be a complex application. You know, what, what's your sense of how, of, of their participation rate? Yeah, I'm going to turn to either Ina or Alicia on that. I, I, I think they fared well, um, but I, I mean, we still have money going out the door, but I'll turn to either Alicia or Ina on, on answering that question. We had 351 total applications for this program, and I think that smaller independent providers of a variety of types are, are fairly well represented in that total number of applications. And, and I think you will see that um, a lot of them will be funded. Am I right? You asking me? No, I'm asking Ina. <laughs> Yes, a lot of them will be funded. <laughs> you saw where we were with our review process, and I think it's 
I think we would um, want to complete the process of all of the layers of review before opining on the on the final funding. Okay. That's all I had, Kevin. Thank you, Tom. And next we'll go to uh, Maureen Yusufer. Maureen. Uh, thanks. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, one of the things the hospital said when we talked to them is they, they really didn't know how much they were applying for. They were kind of putting in all their, their variables and they really weren't sure what was going to net out of that. And um, I think you guys have had a discussion with the hospitals once you came up with their amounts. I mean, is this what they're expecting, more or less? Um, did you get any feedback on that? You know, you've spoken with the hospitals. I think that in general, um, the, the feedback that we received was um, indicated that um, the applicants um, understood the, the formula and how the inputs were used and that the award amounts made sense based on the information they submitted. Okay. In, ge okay. in general. Okay. And then um, just going back to the, the, um, the piece that FEMA was going to cover, are you guys covering 25% of that in this? Because I know, you know, there was two components, right? Thousand. One was lost revenue. Are you and ready? then the other piece was the, you know, new expenses. Right here, um, I don't know who's talking. Can I ask whoever's uh, not muted to please mute the objecting to my question. No, okay. somebody's, somebody isn't muted and we're hearing their background. Sorry about that, Maureen. So the question is, does this include the 25% component? And if so, can you tell us by hospital how much is that piece of it? Um, that way we'll know, you know, what was the lost revenue piece versus what's the 25% piece of the new expenses. Um, because we had heard from some of the hospitals they had asked for that. And so I, I think UVM had said like they had asked for they thought 12 million, so I think nine was going to come from FEMA, and maybe three came from this. And I just want to be able to understand what that piece is. I, I think we can get that information for you. Okay, great. Um, and then, you know, as you know, we've only used, I guess, about you think about 100 million of the dollars. Um, if it doesn't all get spent, um, does that go back into then, you know, what could be used for other COVID expenses elsewhere? Obviously, I hope it gets expense, you know, expensed here. I'm not, but if, if at the end of the day, only 175 million gets used, does that go back into kind of the state fund? I, I think there will be discussions about what to do with the other remaining monies. Um, if there are remaining monies here. I think that's a legislative and administrative sort of uh, uh, process that we're going to have to go through of what we do with the uh, remaining money in. Uh, we're going to know fairly in short order after October where we are. So we're going to have to, it's going to be a negotiation process probably with the legislature and the, um, and the administration. And I, I want to, you know, we're, we're we're not counting sort of the chickens before they hatch yet until we see the second round. Okay. Yeah. No, because obviously we hope this as a state we can use all of the money okay. somewhere, and um, if we can't use it in this area, um, maybe there are other areas. Um, and then, can you tell us who the hospital is that may apply in the second round that didn't apply in this round? Do you know who that is? Um. I don't. I don't know how they, how the conversation was. Um, was it sort of an off, um, off the record conversation, or was it? What, I didn't have it precisely. Yeah. Ina, you probably had the the conversation, or somebody else had the conversation. Yeah, I. It, um, it was somewhat off the record conversation. I think we could confirm with that hospital and get back to you. Okay. Yeah, because I, I would assume that most of the hospitals that did apply um, may certainly apply for the second round, right, for the, the kind of between the June 15th through the September 15th. Um, but then if there's also another hospital that's potentially in the mix, um, 
you know, it would be good to at least know who it is. And Let us ask. I think this is, you know, the, this program is great. I'm glad there's money being funded for it. You know, I just would like to understand, um, you know, for round two, there might be somebody else that comes in. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. A um, couple of follow up questions. Um, just to comment, you know, um, one of the questions was whether the, the hospitals got more or less than what they asked for. And if I if my memory is correct, there's a few that it looks like they got less than what they had hoped for. But then you look at, say, for example, UVM, um, what they had testified in their hearing was they hoped to get a little over nine million in FEMA, uh, about a three million plus match for that remaining 25 percent from the state and then another nine million. So that would have only been a little over 12 million, and here they're getting close to 32 million. So um, I think we have to go back and look at um, the transcripts for the the different hospital uh, hearings. But that's one that really jumped out at me as a significant uh, 20 million dollar difference from what they told us at hearings till today. Um, on the um, And, and I will say I heard from a number of hospitals that said they wish to apply in the second round if they figured out a clear path to do so. So I, I imagine it's going to be more than one that hasn't applied so far. And I would hope that everyone that hasn't applied looks to try to figure out a path if they qualify to at least put the application in. And following up on that, I, I am... Um, it's hard to take off your old hats, Mr. Secretary, and um, I'm just curious since I hope the legislature is not going to be around at the end of October, if um, there's language put in that um, the um, Emergency Committee or JFC uh, could uh, agree with the administration on future things so that we don't let the clock run out. Is that the plan? Yeah, I, I think the legislature and the administration through the secretary of administration is working on a plan right now to how we would use uh, unallocated money. It, I will say that's on the forefront of the administration's mind to make sure that we don't leave any money on the table. And it's certainly going to be, uh, I, I think it's of mutual interest, both by the legislature and and um, and and this administration not to leave any money on the table. Perfect. So were you surprised at the uh, low numbers that are, are in front of you today compared to that $275 million pot that you had? Or were you pleased with what you saw? Or what was your reaction? It, I'll, I'll be honest, I expected more to 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 be honest with you um but then you start to look at these considerations that we that we went over um you got fema money that's being injected you've got the hhs money that's being injected that you know um we looked at you know if, if a hospital's 19 year wasn't was better than you know another year from another hospital you know it it, it, there's a lot of factors that you look in uh, on this, so I can understand what happened. Um, but I was, I, I, I frankly thought all 14 would apply. That's what I had hoped for, but not what we saw. But and you mentioned 19. We had a few hospitals. It was more than one um, that ran into um, some unforeseen probably should have been foreseen, but scenarios where their revenues declined in 19 because of changes, um, we can pick like Northwestern, for example. Um, they implemented a new health record that uh, cut their productivity immensely. Um, we saw problems at another hospital, um, pretty clear it's UVM when I say what I'm about to say, that um, had to, um, shut down its um, surgical operations at a site. And those are the type of things, I'm just wondering if there's a way to do some creative accounting to account for um, the fact that 
they're being um, put against numbers that would have been much higher if it hadn't been for those situations that occurred in 19. Yeah, I mean, there's always an argument for that. Um, and there's always an argument in every year for that, uh, d depending on the institution. Um, we, we wanted to be as consistent as possible uh, in this allocation. And uh, so we were consistent in terms of making sure everything was apples to apples and oranges to oranges on this, this uh, sort of process. But you're absolutely right. If you had a bad revenue year in 18, you know, you are, um, you are under this formula, you're not going to fare as well as if you, if, if somebody had a, excuse me, 19, if somebody had a good revenue year in 19. Okay. I think that is probably it for my questions. No, actually there's one more. <laughs> so, um, a number of hospitals have made the argument to the board that um, these dollars are fixing shortfalls in 20 and should not be calculated into any decisions on their budgets for 21. What are your thoughts on that, Mr. Secretary? Oh, man. Um, uh, my thought is, um, I don't know what my thought is, so I'm going to make it up as I... I, I sit here. I mean, these are fiscal year um, 20 expenses. Uh, you know, they they um, were mostly in this round, they were mostly in um, before the end of, uh, of, of their fiscal year. I don't remember what hospital's fiscal year is. I think UVM is September 30th or the end of September. I don't remember if the rest of them are on a federal sort of fiscal year, as as I would say, or a uh, you know uh, June thirtieth fiscal year. Um, but if it's on a June thirtieth fiscal year, I mean these are expenses that happened in that fiscal year. Um, I. Uh, that's why you guys, you guys get paid the big bucks. For this. Fiscal year for all of them right now. What's that? I'm sorry. It's an October one to September September thirty fiscal year for all of them right now. Yeah, I, I would say the bulk of these expenses happened in a 2020 year. The the bulk of lost revenue and, and expenses happened in 2020 year. I would uh, I would defer to the good judgment of the board how that would uh, play out um, in terms of your your um, deliberations. Let me try to ask it in a different way. It was <laughs> Was one of the goals of the state of Vermont to try to keep down um, the impact felt by Vermonters in rising rates? I, I'll tell you what, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question precisely, but I'll tell you what the thinking was behind this. And it's always been the thinking. I was really worried during the height of the pandemic that our healthcare system was collapsing. Um, and I was, I was, trying everything that I possibly could do to make sure that it didn't collapse um, at the time when we needed the healthcare system up and running. And not only needed it up and running for that period of time, but needed it up and running after that period of time, because we we're going to open it back up again. Um, so everything that I drove, all, all my thought process, including the stabilization fund, which, which basically came out of this office, was was under the mindset of stabilizing the healthcare system. That's that was the main motivation motivation for all what I was doing during the time. Great, and a lot of people don't know that um, just how important government was in the early stages of this pandemic to make sure that institutions weren't talking about the possibility of having to close doors. And I know that it, at least one institution you put money out to, and I, I will say this, I, I usually criticize the federal government quite a bit. I was just amazed at how quickly they got money out the door. And without that, our healthcare system would have been a complete mess. And of course, whenever you have to hurry to do something, you don't make it perfect. But I'll tell you what, if 
if the measurement is that nobody had fears about um, the healthcare system collapsing in Vermont, um, it was achieved because of swift action from government and for no other reason. So um, I know that you played an integral role in that and uh, thank you very much for that. With that, I'll yeah, open it up. Ask, to, sorry, can I ask ahead. one question? So, sure. Um, just uh, on your inputs for, for comparison, did you factor in if a hospital had asked for, you know, a rate increase, which most of them did for 2020? So example being, right, if in 2019, during this time period, they did 100 million and they had a 10% rate increase. Of course, we didn't give that, but um, so in the, in the same period, they would have been 110, right? And now they're coming in at a at, at 90, did you only give them 10 or did you give them 20 for the fact that they, cause, cause I think that is a miss. That's so just want to understand your formula. Yeah, I don't think we calculated that in, but Ina helped me out or, or Alicia helped me out on that. I don't believe the formula uh, is that, um, I yeah. don't believe that your formula does include and acknowledge that. Yeah, cause if we're, you know, trying to look at what really was missed that that would have been a would have been missed. So if you're if you're looking to uh, spend some more of the money, and the hospitals can can uh, that this they'll say is this Maureen saying this? No, but if you're looking to spend some more of the money, I mean, I think that's a potential way to look at that, because anything whether it was Medicaid, Medicare, or commercial, if there were rate increases that were embedded into their forecast, that was assumed they would receive that. And their expenses are aligned up with that. So if we're looking at that miss, I think that is something that should be factored in. Just well, let us look. Let us look at it. I mean, there's yeah. a second round, and um, but let us look at that. Okay. Okay. Because you know, because certainly it was in their budgets, and you know, there that that would be part of it. So I think it would be a good thing to look at. Thanks. Thanks, Marina. Are there any other follow-up questions from the board, Robin? Yes, thank you. Um, I, my follow-up question was from your and Mike's interchange. Um, and uh, what I was noticing is that, so in our guidance, we did allow hospitals to ask for a one-year commercial charge request related to 2020 expenses. And there are two hospitals who did that who did not apply for AHS relief funds, um, Brattleboro and a, Mount Scutney. So I'm Curious. Um, it so my reaction to that is that I would want to encourage them, perhaps strongly, to apply in the second round. So I just wanted to get your reaction to my reaction to see if you thought that was an appropriate uh, request of them. I would encourage them <laughs> to apply in the second round. Thank you. And I think there might have been a third one as well, Robin. Okay, I'm. I, For some reason, I'm thinking good. Northeast fits in that same. Oh category. yeah, no, I think you're right. Yep, I think you're yep. right. Okay, other follow up from the board. If not, we'll open it up to public comment. So I have a hand raised from Jeff Teeman. Jeff. <sighs> Jeff, are you there? Star six, Jeff. Just kidding. <laughs> I do see your hand raised, Jeff. Hopefully, uh... it looks like he's on mute, though. From the p participants list, he's muted. How do star six? <laughs> Is that true? Is it star six? I think it is for this too. Abigail, anything you can do? <clears throat> Unfortunately, no. Um, he's participating through the computer, so you have to unmute yourself. So Jeff, did you try clicking on the mic? <laughs> so so this is Mike Del Treco. Um, I'm texting Jeff to let him know he's on mute as well. Um, or something along those lines, but I'm happy to 
I think where we work so closely together, I'm happy to sort of uh, fill in on uh, the public comment. And really, um, probably what I am thinking he might be saying is, or would want to say is that these COVID funds, we should really look at those as the current year um, and not, not 2021. Um, 2021 is an independent year. The losses occurred in 20. Uh, retrospective, not prospective, and I think it would be in uh, you know great jeopardy to start um, reducing hospital budgets based on these dollars um, because they're they're really designed to cover COVID-19 losses, um, impacts to expenses, uh, and there's certainly um, several conditions that were in play. The FEMA piece. Um, uh, participating in the value-based programs. So, uh, you know, really retrospective, not prospective. And um, so that would, that's the, the, the comment that I would make at this point in time. Can people hear me now by chance? We can. Okay, thank you. I apologize for that. I was literally madly pressing both my camera and my microphone and they were not responding um, as I asked. So um, now the camera's not working. So can't uh, show myself, but I'll just underline Mike's comment because um, I think he he captured what I was going to say, um, and I you know because I wanted to emphasize I think Secretary Smith's point um, on the CARES Act money being retrospective, not prospective. And then the only other point I would add to Mike Del Treco's comments is that even at the federal level with the CARES Act dollars, there was not an intention, at least not any kind of stated intention, to mitigate future rate increases. Or, or otherwise address sort of consumer coverage or cost issues from a system standpoint. So wanted to get that point on the record as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I see Susan Aronoff's hand up. Uh, yes. Um, hi. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is either a question for the board or for uh, the secretary. But I am curious about the hospitals that did not apply because of the requirement to maintain their existing um, ACO footprint, their one care participation. I know that uh, Mount Ascutney was one of those hospitals. I'm wondering which other hospitals um, didn't apply for that reason and what you would say to the people who depend on those hospitals for services about um, that uh, need to be to maintain their ACO footprint if that doesn't seem to be in the hospital's best financial interest. And yet they risk losing out on this money. Thank you. Before I turn Before it over turn it to over. the secretary, I do want to point out that Mount Scutney did um, file an amendment to their budget, and they are participating um, fully in um, uh, the Alpair model. So they would, if that's a reason why they chose not to apply, they certainly could do that in the second round, um, Mr. Secretary. Yeah, I didn't hear um, of any hospitals that were talking about the reason they weren't applying was because um, uh, of the requirement of per uh, participating in the, sort of the all-payer model. Um, I did, I do anticipate that what was happening was there was a lot of federal money coming in from different places and, and how it would stack up with the formula once all that federal money came in probably was not going to show that they were going to be successful in getting a grant award um, with the federal money that was coming in through the door. I think um, I think when you see the second round and they have they can look over a broader period of expenses, you'll start to see um, some of the hospitals that didn't apply apply. Well, with respect to Mount Scutney. I appreciate, Mr. Chair, that um, Mount Scutney might have amended their budget, but what they had filed and what the uh, narrative said, the slides that were presented to the board, was that in response to the question from the healthcare advocate, they specifically stated that at that point in time, the reason they weren't seeking the funds was the requirement to maintain the ACL footprint, and they're feeling that it was just too risky a decision to make at that time. So it just seemed like uh, competing requirements, you know, you want to help the hospitals, but then you have them hamstrung into this risk arrangement. Um, 
It's a coalition of the willing, Susan. Or the coerced. Yep. Other public comment? Any other public comment? If not, again, I, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary and uh, Ina and Alicia. Um, I know that you guys have been putting in a, a lot of long hours uh, trying to get uh, this figured out. And um, we're glad to hear that it's not just the larger players that are being able to uh, receive some help. Um, we certainly have heard from a lot of uh, independent practices, the, the uh, hardships that they endured. So I'm very pleased to see that uh, it's a broad brush approach to trying to help the entire healthcare system. And thank you again for all your efforts. Thank you, and thank you for the time. We'll uh, we'll see you later. And hopefully you'll have another celebrity to uh, foist on us in the near future. <laughs> I think we're out <laughs> of celebrities. <laughs> we'll see you, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> okay, with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Patrick and his team. And um, one of the things that I thought um, might make sense to do first, and I did ask uh, Patrick to um, work on this, is to try to um, go through the the different um, uh, provider practice changes, transfers, and also accounting changes, and try to, um, you know, start to vote on some of those things that um, are, in my mind, some low-hanging fruit. Is there any objection from any of the other board members? Okay, hearing none, Patrick, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. My computer has decided it doesn't recognize speakers anymore, so I have to call in today. And uh, <laughs> Lori, <laughs> Lori is going to drive the PowerPoint. And uh, one second, please. Before we get into the accounting adjustments and the provider transfers we're just going to give the the public a brief update on some of the changes we've made since the last presentation and we provided that to you all yesterday afternoon with the updated slide deck so in full transparency we'll run through that really quick and then i'll turn it over to lori for provider transfers and accounting adjustments one second please Yours may not be the only computer that's acting up today, Patrick. <laughs> there you go. Great. There we are, Lori. Okay, so as Chair Mullen described earlier, uh, Mount Scotty has submitted an updated budget. We have taken care to update the appropriate slides with all of that information. I won't run through all of those because their update does tweak all of the um, system slides as well slightly. There isn't much of a uh, movement of the needle there, but um, <clears throat> they have submitted uh, an update to their budget with uh, the intent to participate in uh, the uh, One Care programs in the coming year. Uh, Lori, if you could move to slide 20, please. We have updated this slide as well to indicate Mount Scutney's participation. Uh, and then, Lori, if you could navigate to slides uh, 114. Or maybe it's 115, I'm sorry. Oh, well, up, up one. No, I guess it's down two. Is it 116? I'm looking for the change in charge slide that we updated for Porter. I guess I had my slides off. It's 113. 
So per the board's request, we broke out the overall and commercial effective rates for Porter Medical Center and Central Vermont. Um, we did notice while doing this that there's been an error in fiscal year 17 that dates back several years where uh, we had it listed that they were approved for a 5.3% increase, but they only asked for a 3.7% increase, and that does not make any sense. So we're going to own that mistake, and we have corrected that. We've also, uh, in, in breaking this out, we recognized while we were doing so that we've been intermingling the approved and submitted overall and commercial effective rate increases. You can see there are several years there in 17, 18, and in 20, where Porter did not ask for an overall increase in change in charges, but they did ask for a commercial effective rate and were approved for a commercial effective rate. And we've been intermingling the two when looking at the approved and submitted five-year average. So those figures on the right for both Porter and Central Vermont are going to be different than in the last presentation, and that is why we've been using um, two different numbers to talk about approved versus submitted, and now we're going to break that out. And as these network hospitals are the only hospitals that applies to, there won't be any correct made to the remainder of the hospitals. Um, moving on, Lori, to slide 128, please. I hope I have my number right. Second guessing myself now. All right, it is correct. Um, per the board's recommendation as well, last time we have added in some columns that show the impact of the staff recommendation on system-wide MPR, the fourth column to the right, versus the column directly to the left of that as submitted by the hospitals. And on the far right, that would include um, the adjustments should the board recognize those. And that's what Lori's gonna talk about in a couple of minutes. And finally, Lori, if you could navigate to slide 132 through 135. <clears throat> Thank you, Lori. We were asked by the board the last go around as we made some recommendations regarding hospital provider taxes <clears throat> to um, post some information within this slide deck. So we've included it in the appendix. And that includes a reasonability assessment that we did on the provider tax applying 6% um, tax to the FY2020 projected MPR as submitted by the hospitals in their budget. And to support the argument we were making last time, uh, we pulled an extract from one of the hospital's uh, submissions that talks about how the ca tax is calculated on the prior year net patient revenue. And because there's going to be a reduction in that revenue in fiscal year 20, the result will be a lower tax in 2021. And our argument has been that there are a couple of hospitals where the discrepancies seem to not fall in line with that methodology. So on the next slide, <clears throat> we've done a, a brief analysis of the year-to-year -year growth in the tax for those three hospitals that we were discussing in our recommendations last time in UVM, Central Vermont, and Brattleboro. And you can see here that the year-over-year -year growth takes a um, significant spike moving into the fiscal year 2021 budget for the medical center. On slide 134, you'll see a similar trend with Central Vermont. And on slide 135, we'll also see it for Brattleboro as well, showing that they are budgeting a half a million dollar increase in their provider tax um, year to year. So those were requested by the board to show support for um, the recommendation and the discussion last time. So we've um, taken measures to include that in, in the presentation updates for this, the discussions moving forward. So with those updates, I will turn it over to Lori to begin to discuss the hospitals who have um, either noted some of the provider transfers or um, accounting adjustments in their budgets. And Lori, when you're ready, take it away. I'm ready. We should be on slide 76. Everybody hopefully can see that. We're going to be talking about Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, Mount Escutney, and Northwestern. But mainly it will be Brattleboro Memorial and Northwestern because Mount Escutney's adjustments were enhanced services and they were just explaining their changes or the growth in their NPR. So we showed you these slides here. We are asking the board to acknowledge slide 78 where Brattleboro Memorial is having just so pediatrics coming out of their hospital and going to their independent primary care 
instead of staying in the hospital. We're also going to be having the board acknowledge their accounting adjustment for ACO fees, which we ask them to stop um, netting it against NPR, but to record it in their operating expenses. So we've asked all the hospitals to do that. And so Brattleboro and Northwestern are showing those accounting adjustments this year. The other ones had uh, corrected that type of information in previous years. So um, this is a slide showing the NPR, the expenses, and the profit and loss that is supposed to be affected for July 31st for this Just So Pediatrics. It's a 1% effect to the NPR. And this was their justification for making this change. As it, it says on this slide, the uh, Brattleboro Primary Care consolidated due to the insufficient, inadequate, just so pediatrics office space and because of COVID. And so they also had clinicians retire and also they were, uh, had an inability to practice on site due to COVID. So this practice had um, three quarters of a provider FTE and eight non-provider FTEs. And like I mentioned, they're 1% impact on NPR. Um, the, this chart shows their gross revenue, net patient revenue, expenses, and their net operating income or loss. And we are asking the board to um, acknowledge this provider transfer. And it was just effective a, July 31st. Just a quick yes. question um, for our legal counsel. Um, is it more appropriate to separate out motions um, for the same hospital? Uh, in this particular case, there's a, a provider transfer issue and there's an accounting issue. Um, should they be combined into one motion or separate? Uh, I, in case there's disagreement amongst the board members, I think it's best to separate them. Okay. We put in suggested motion language if you want. This is on slide 86. So, that so just just on the uh, the practices first, um, does a board member wish to make a motion? I can go ahead and move uh, that the board acknowledges Brattleboro Memorial Hospital's request to adjust its 2021 budget to reflect consolidation of Just So Pediatrics uh, Clinic into Brattleboro Primary Care on July 31st, 2020. I'm, I'm, and I guess uh, with an impact uh, on their NPR of 1% and conditioned on required notice to patients pursuant to Act 143. Second. So Oops. it's been moved and seconded. Um, General Counsel, um, do we have to open it up for public comment on each motion? I think that would be the best practice um, okay. or have staff go through each of these, open it up for public comment on everything and then do the motions and votes after that um, either way. But yeah, I think there should be public comment on on these. Okay, I'm gonna stick to uh, one issue at a time. So we're just do the uh, uh, provider transfer and any board comment. Is there any public comment on the motion? Is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Let the record show that that was unanimous. Lori, if you could move on to the next. Well, the provider transfer. Do you want to handle the accounting adjustment first, Kevin, or? Yeah, I'm not sure that she walked us through that yet, though, Robin. Um, basically, there wasn't that much. All I was talking about was why we asked them to do the accounting adjustment. It was the ACO dues that were included in their net patient revenue as an offset. And now we're asking them to record it in their operating expenses. And it's an effect of a 0.5% to their NPR. 
sorry, I didn't say that previously. Okay, so if you could move to that motion, is there a board member that wishes to uh, make a motion? I will move that the board acknowledge Brattleboro Memorial Hospital's requested accounting adjustment, reclassifying their dues to One Care Vermont from an offset to NPR to operating expenses with an impact to NPR of negative 0.5 percent. Is there That's a second? second? Thank you, Jess. Is there board discussion? Just a quick question here. Um, so <clears throat> this has happened with some other hospitals, and I'm just wondering: um, is it are all the hospitals now in the same bucket uh, in terms of uh, how they handle their dues as an expense versus a, an offset um, against revenue? As far as we know, we can uh, ask them that question again, probably um, probably next month and get a date September report for fiscal year 20 if we want more clarification yeah just trying to make sure we're it's apples to apples as much as possible oh yeah very helpful okay other board questions or comments is there any public comment is there any further board discussion Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was a unanimous vote. And I think we'll hold off on uh, anything other than those type of decisions for a hospital at this point. So if we could move to the next one. Uh, Mount Scutney is not necessarily asking you to approve these because the this is slide 88 where we're just explaining expansion of services. And so they had a urology and a neurologist and in total they have an impact of 1.8% to the NPR. So we are not giving any motion language on these particular but it was just an explanation for some of their growth. Uh, well, in my mind, if we could stick on Mount Escutney for a minute, I actually think it's helpful if the board does acknowledge it, because what we're talking about here with the urologist isn't new dollars to the system. It's dollars moving from a different area. So I think it's important that we do acknowledge that there are new dollars that are added to Mount Escutney, but there was a decrease in dollars from a, a nearby hospital. That's correct. So would someone like to make an motion to acknowledge? Um, I, I can, Kevin, but I would actually like to take a quick look at Act 143 because I think that I'm not sure that this actually falls under Act 143. So I think we could just acknowledge it in our underlying budget discussion, but maybe Mike already looked at that. I did. Or I, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I think um, we all came to the conclusion that this was not a provider transfer that was covered by act, that act and by our policy, um, but was more of a justification for an NBR increase. And so it was not something you really needed to vote on and could kind of absorb into your discussion and deliberation on the on the budget. But um, Okay, I'm comfortable with not taking an, an action if everybody else is. I just thought it would uh, be better to acknowledge the fact that uh, their NPR um, should be a little bit higher due to this expansion. But well, maybe I, Kevin, one idea would be to include that as um, in the order as a as a consideration. So when in our or a very good our, suggestion, Robin. Thank you. So, Mike, if you could make sure that it gets into the written order. Yep, I'm making a mental note. Thank you. Go ahead, Lori. So then the other enhanced service was the neurologist, and that was at the Veterans Hospital, so they're sharing that provider. Yeah, I think we're good with the uh, amount of scutney now. All right. 
So Northwestern, um, they had provider transfers, service enhancements, and accounting adjustments. Um, the t provider transfers were the Cold Hollow Family Practice and Northwestern Partners in Hope. I'll go to those first. They, Cold Hollow Family Practice was in their fiscal year 20 budget, and they found that they did not acquire this practice. Um, so they want to take into consideration that information when they're doing their 21 budget. So these are all negative dollars um, against their 20 budget. And it was one provider and eight non-providers, and it's equal to 0.65% impact to the NPR. So this is the cold hall of family practice. And this was effective this last January. The other one is um, the Northwestern Partners in Hope and Recovery. We heard about this one this summer that um, they divested of this particular practice and now it's in the community and it is equal to one provider, but 11 non-provider FTEs. And it's an impact of 0.25% to the NPR and it was effective July 31st, 2020. I don't know if you wanted to vote on those first, and then I'll show you the enhancement. That would be good um, if you if you okay, could get, so to, the get to the language on that vote. Sure, the first the top part. So, does the board member wish to make a motion? I'll make a motion that the board acknowledge Northwestern Medical Center's request to adjust its fiscal year uh, 21 budget to reflect transfers of Cold Hollow Family Practice and Northwestern Partners in Hope with an impact to their NPR of 0.9% and conditioned on required notice to patients pursuant to Act 143. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there board discussion? I do have a question. Um, Go ahead. Uh, it's Lori. I. I did. I meant to go back and check on this, so I. But I forgot. So my apologies to ask you out of the blue. But the Cold Hollow Family Practice was the practice that we had approved last year, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, and is my motion actually right that we're adjusting the 21 budget, even though both of these transfers happened in 20? It, it's basically how it, when we're doing these um, type of adjustments. We're kind of adjusting the 20 budget to reflect that it'll be less when you compare it to the 21 budget. So actually it's going to show that 21 is more in NPR because of these two practices. Got it. Thank you for that explanation. I'm good. Okay, anyone else from the board? If not, I'll open it up for public comment on the motion. Hearing none, is there any further discussion by the board? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries unanimously. Um, Lori. I'll go to just to give you some idea on the enhancement. Uh, expansion, excuse me is um, they talked about the ICU, Dutella ICU with Dartmouth. And they <clears throat> talked about this also this last spring in their um, request for an amended budget. Um, this is, uh, they wanted to offer this to retain the lower acuity ICU patients and allow them to receive service locally. It is effective April 1st, 2020. And they have zero provider FTEs, but five non-provider FTEs. This is an impact of 1.3% to the NPR. And like we mentioned, this is just a justification for any growth in their NPRs. The next one is pulmonology, and this is a routine expansion at Northwestern. This is zero FTEs to non-provider FTEs and a negative 0.2% impact on NPR. 
we are not asking for any motion language on that those. So I'll go back to the accounting adjustment. And that again is with the ACO. And that was 931,000. And that was originally in there an offset against their NPR. And now it's going into operating expenses and it's a negative 0.8% for NPR impact. So the motion language is the second paragraph. Is there a board member who wishes to make a motion? I will move that the board acknowledge Northwestern Medical Center's requested accounting adjustment reclassifying their one care Vermont dues uh, from an offset to NPR to operating expenses with an impact to NPR of negative 0.8%. Is there a second? Second. Is there board discussion? Hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment. Is there any public comment on this motion? Hearing none, any further board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Lori. So with those approved, and when you go to make your uh, vote, this will be reflected in the last column of this particular graph. So right now at, at staff recommendations, system-wide is 2.93% growth in NPR. And that concludes our discussion on transfers and accounting adjustments. Thank you very much, Lori. If there is no objection, I next would like to proceed to um, what uh, the health system finance team believes might be the, the low hanging fruit, just to see if we might be able to knock off a couple more today. OK. Certainly. And um, just to be aware, do we have an hour left, Kevin? Um, I will leave it uh, to your discretion if you um, wish to keep going or if you need more time at any point, we will delay um, proceeding till tomorrow, Patrick. But um, as far as my understanding is, I think everybody has till 430 blocked off. But again, okay. we don't. We're not going to make decisions if you're not ready to have that discussion. Certainly. OK, Lori, if you could proceed to the first slide on Gifford Medical Center, please. All right, thank you. Um, so to begin the discussion on fiscal year 2021 budgeted NPR, Approval and change in charge. Here we are again at Gifford. Um, nothing on this slide has changed since last week. Um, their request is a negative 0.6% from prior year budget with a change in charge of 4%. And the staff would approve this as submitted. Um, the change in charge is lower than their historical five year average. And this hospital has uh, budgeted conservatively going into the next year, and they have um, made a solid effort with cost reduction plans in the past couple of years to um, turn the hospital around financially. And of course, there's also the hospital justification here that includes that um, improvement plan and cost savings programs. Um, this is a hospital too that also has an aging physical plant that is going to have to be updated in the near future and they will require um, an appropriate level of funding to do so so with that we would laurie if you could move to the motion language page first off do we want to show this yeah this is more excuse me mm -hmm. that's it so with that we would turn it to the board to open it up for discussion board members gifford medical center Anybody wish to kick it off? Yeah, I'll just uh, <clears throat> you 
get it started by just saying that um, they're in compliance with our guidelines. Um, I think we've all followed them over the past few years as they've dug themselves out of a very difficult situation and uh, you know have uh, righted the ship of state at Gifford. Um, they uh, um, seem to have handled the uh, the COVID situation very well and with pro outreach programs like uh, uh, um, the Veggie Van Gogh. And uh, I, um, you know, I, I, I can support the motion as presented. Did you wish to make that motion? Um, if nobody else has any comments, I'll try to read the motion as well as Robin reads them. <laughs> I don't know if you can do that. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm I sure can. you can. I'm sure you can. But uh, I had a question that is a little bit more of a global question, which is, um, I was curious how people are, are thinking about the CRF money that we just talked about, because Gifford is one of the hospitals that did receive CFR money from AHS. So I didn't know if we wanted to talk about that on kind of a higher level in terms of how we're thinking about it. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. And I just was pulling out their projection and, um, you know, they they received about $900,000 in the CRF money. Um, there. They were projecting $3.6 million um, well, they were projecting a, a 1.3 million in net operating income compared to their budget of 1.5 and 3.6 and total operating income compared to 2.4. Um, I'm not sure how they handled the 900,000. I'm thinking it's not in there. So it's, it's probably just gonna strengthen their cash position. Um, for this hospital, I am okay with their, this request. Um, including the change in charge and their NPR request, um, include knowing the fact as well that they did get 900,000. I think it just helps strengthen their balance sheet and they've struggled a lot in the past several years. But but I do think it's important, um, as you brought up, Robin, to, to bring up what people got because it does change their cash flows going into the future years as far as what the amount of cash they'll have in days cash on hand. You know, we've heard some public comments about it's 2020, which it is 2020 that this is occurring in, but those hospitals that receive money it certainly strengthens their balance sheet um, if it more if it wasn't reflected in their original submissions. I, I would just add to that that um, I think Gifford has the um, worst um, age of plant uh, as a problem. They're um, at a 21.3 years versus a, a system-wide average of 14.7. So if uh, they can strengthen their bottom line, um, uh, they certainly have a call on uh, on some money going forward in terms of their investments in in in, in plant. I think Southwest yeah. they, they, for that they same do have category as well. With the age of plant, they seem to be the two oldest. I can support the the budget as submitted um, for the reasons outlined. I think this has been a turnaround hospital. I think they do need us to support their bottom line. I do think their age of plant is high. Um, they'll need the capital to make those kinds of expenditures. I just want to note. Um, my hope is that next year the requested change in charge is on the lower end. They have been there at the top. Their five-year change in charge average has been 4.5%. So my hope just going into next year is that there is a way that they can not be at the top <laughs> um, and work towards reducing the change in charge. But I do support this budget for this year. And I, I would echo that same comment in that um, not only their five-year average, but their total cost of care um, for that service area is high. But Giffords, if Patrick, am I correct, a 1.8% uh, operating margin proposed under their budget? Yeah. So, Thank you, Lori. You know, that's a, uh, another reason why uh, I would support this budget is they're, they're, they're 
not asking to uh, um, for what I would call the moon. They're asking for reasonable uh, numbers here, even though the change in charge does trouble me as it has troubled others. Um, but I do think that uh, this is a reasonable request. I do, um, again, think that thank you to government for what they were able to do, because not only was government able to help the hospital side of this equation, but we heard in the hearings where the FQHC is sitting on some substantial dollars there as well. Um, and again, this is one of the three FQHC owned hospitals in the country. And, um, you know, they've come a long way from a couple of years ago. And so, uh, again, even though that change of charge uh, troubles me to uh, some extent, um, I'm very supportive and uh, look forward to, to supporting this budget request. So, Kevin, if I can chime in real quick, Lori, can you scroll down a slide to the change in charge uh, breakout? Yeah. So, with this approval, that FY16 significant um, change in charge of 5.8 is going to drop off. So once you average in that 4% for this year, that 4.5 should be coming down um, pretty quickly. And the just add, to add again, though, that the total cost of care in that service area is high compared to others. So, you know, I sometimes I worry about these heavy reliance on uh, change in charges because what could be a um, uh, uh, 5% change in charge for uh, a hospital could still result in then them having lower costs for specific procedures than another hospital that only got a 1% change in charge. So that's one of the things that has always troubled me as a member of this board. Other comments from board members? Let me just make sure I know that uh, Tom, you were ready to make the motion. <clears throat> so um, I move to approve Gifford Medical Center's budget as submitted with a six tenths of one percent decrease from fiscal year 2020 to fiscal year 2021. Budgeted NPR FPP at four percent increase to overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slides 27. I will is there second. A second. Okay, thank you. Um, is there um, further board discussion? If not, I'll open it up to public comment on the motion. Hearing none, is there any further board discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Laura, your Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next up, we are moving to uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. <clears throat> Uh, as you can see, their FY21 request is 3% uh, below the NPR FVP uh, request uh, approved budget for fiscal year 20 with a change in charge of 3.5%. Um, they did note that they are budgeting down in a few areas where they have not uh, historically um, hit numbers in recent years, um, but also due to um, some of the considerations around safety protocols, et cetera, that COVID will um, bring about as part of their business, a part of their business moving forward. Again, this is a, a hospital with an average age of plant that is rising. Capital improvements are in the near future. They do have um, improvements that are uh, really close at hand to becoming to coming to fruition. So they will be outlaying some capital um, to make those improvements. This is a hospital that <clears throat> uh, continues to make um, significant use of telehealth and will continue to do so. So they are kind of on the cutting edge of that. Um, and part of that is their association with Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they were operating below budget, uh, about 5% going into February or pre-COVID. Um, they do continue to uh, plan participation with the ACO. 
um, and there's no service line adjustments coming for this hospital. And they also have a, Laurie, if you could navigate to the next slide. Yes, they have a strong history of, of budget management. And uh, even though this is a year of uncertainty, um, historically their, their work has proven out um, very close to um, what they've come to the board for. As you can see also, um, their operating margin here compared to historical figures is uh, minute at a 0.1% operating margin budgeted for fiscal year 2021. So Laura, if you could navigate to the um, final slide, the motion language. <clears throat> uh, this is a budget that falls within our guidelines, the NPR at uh, 3% below. Um, budget to budget and a change in charge of 3.5%. Staff have recommended that um, both of these be approved as submitted, and we would turn it over to the board for discussion. So I'll start the discussion just by saying that um, this is a hospital that, again, has a very old age of plant that um, I actually hope that this is the year that um, they're actual numbers come in different than their budget, even though this is one that has managed to their budget so well. Um, I would like to uh, hope that um, their revenues exceed the expectations of this budget. Um, and the reason for that is that um, bare operating margin that um, is about as close to zero as you can get. And I just uh, worry that uh, um, you know, this is an institution that needs to have a, a better operating margin than than just above zero. But I think the the credit goes to them because they recognize the uncertain times that we're in today. And I have to say that um, I was very impressed with, at the hearing by what um, Steve Majetic and Tom D had to say. And so I'll kick it off by saying that I I would uh, support the staff recommendation. Others on the board? Yeah, I also um, support the recommendation. And um, if just going back to the chart that you had on before with their margins, um, in, you know, they are also possible. I think they have, I think they were getting 6.5 million in the proposal that we just saw from Mike Smith. So that should bring them back um, for their 20 year end projection closer to their budget had been um, 6 million and they're coming in at 1.5 and I'm assuming that 6 million is going to come in there. So they'll, they'll be back on budget, but yes, in 21, you know, they did not um, ask for uh, much at all in their operating margin. So I do support their increase. Um, you know, one thing we should note is when we looked at Gifford with their 4% increase, they had 4% across the board, including professional. Um, this is 5% for hospital inpatient and 5% for outpatient, just just uh, and 0% for professional, which is what we see um, at a lot of the hospitals where they don't change the professional based on the rate sheets they have, but it will be a 5% um, change for inpatient and outpatient, even though the overall change in charge is three and a half, but I, I'm still supportive of it. I just want to make sure we're acknowledging that as well. Thank you, Maureen. Other members of the board? I would just like to add that um, <clears throat> Southwestern, I think, has the highest or second highest participation with in fixed prospective payments, and, uh, um, and I think they've been a, a pretty high uh, for uh, a number of years, um, so that's uh, that's something to um, uh, applaud, I think. Would a board member like to make a motion or further comments? Go ahead. Uh, this is Robin. I was going to say that I I agree with what you and Maureen have said, so I'm there as well, and I'm happy to make the motion. Um, that would be good. Okay, then I move to approve Southwestern Vermont Medical Center budget as submitted with a 3% decrease in their fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21 budgeted NPR FPP, a 3.5% increased overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 27. 
Is there a second to the motion? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there further board discussion? Any comments? If not, I'll open a comment actually, Kevin, um, which is just a simple one. I support this budget as well for all the reasons outlined. But I do want to just point out that my hope again is that the change in charge next year is not in the 5% range simply because their commercial to Medicare ratio is actually the highest of all the hospitals already. So I just want to kind of throw that out there that as we're looking at, you know, changes in charge next year that I'm hoping that this is a year where they can, you know, fully recover and find other mechanisms to, to make their bottom line rather than change in uh, commercial rates. Thank you, Jess. Is there anyone else from the board who wishes to uh, offer any comment? If not, I'll open it up to the public for discussion. Is there any public comment on the current motion before the uh, board to approve Southwestern Vermont Medical Center's budget? Hearing none, I'll, I'll throw it back to the board if there's any further discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Lori and Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, moving on next is North Country Hospital. Their FY21 NPR FPV request is um, being reduced 1.1% from their fiscal year 20 budget. Uh, with a request of a 3.6% change in charge. Uh, the hospital was operating about 2.7% below budget as of February. Again, a uh, the pre-COVID months of fiscal year 2020. Um, they are projected to end 2020 and having recovered all of the operational losses from 2017 and 2018. And again, this is a hospital that was under financial duress, but in the last couple of years has uh, made a rebound <clears throat> in that arena. Um, they did outline some service line changes on, um, well, this slide is updated, Laurie, if you could, oh, right here, um, divested Derby Green Nursing Home, um, the neurology, cardiology, ophthalmology. Um, they are partnering with other area hospitals to meet the needs of their rural community. And this is something that has been encouraged by this board as well. Um, and the work that they are doing with uh, Dartmouth and NBRH, hoping to do with NBRH, um, would kind of meet those aims uh, of the Green Mountain Care Board. So um, we feel that they are actively exploring um, alternatives to, to uh, providing some care. They're thinking outside the box. And <clears throat> um, that growing collaboration uh, is important to, to meet the challenges in a rural state like Vermont to provide necessary health care. Um, Lori, if you could navigate down to the uh, budget and margin slide, please. So they're budgeting a margin of 1.7%. Um, this is in line with um, what they are projecting for this year and what they received in 2019. And with that, we would approve as submitted both the budget and the change in charge for North Country Hospital. Who would like to start off for the board? Yeah, I'll just start okay. off. I mean, I'm supportive of, of the budget as provided. Um, they were one hospital that did appear to get quite a bit of um, support from all the funding sources and um, you know, did bring them back whole or even more than whole. I think we we're looking at whether they were going to have to pay back some of the money that they received. But um, I think both their margins this year and next year are, well, this year could be high depending on what they get, but, but um, you know, are where they should be. So I'm supportive of this, this, especially with where they've been looking at their history of 17 and 18. Um, they're, you know, back on the right track. So.
other members of the board? I don't have much yeah. to add. I, I think this is a reasonable request and uh, backed by the evidence in the submissions, and I support it, and I support the staff, staff's recommendation. Other comments from the board? <clears throat> I'll echo uh, Maureen and Jess. Um, I note that they, you know, they they do have a lot of uh, a significant amount. I think it's about two and a half million dollars worth of carry forward from their um, non -re you know non refundable COVID money. Um, so there's some cushion there. Um, assuming from an audit point of view, they can keep it. Um, their uh, effort on navigators, and I mean this being the Northeast Kingdom with a very high Medicaid population, and the fact that their bad debt and free care was trending down because of their use of, of navigators is something I think that other hospitals might be able to learn from. And um, and another question I had, but you know, was uh, Maureen's discussion with them during the board in terms of their um, <clears throat> their top top line, you know, um, uh, and and uh, you know not having any of that kind of fall to the bottom line, but uh, um, you know, so it, so uh, I'm glad Maureen asked the question, and um, I'm glad uh, that I see that you know that question was answered. And I'm I'm I agree with what everybody else said, and I could make a motion if you're ready for it, Kevin. Certainly. I move we approve North Country Hospitals budget as submitted with a 1.1 percent decrease from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21 budgeted NPR FPP, a 3.6 percent increase to overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 27. A second. So it's been moved and seconded to uh, approve North Country's hospital budget as submitted. And um, I will say as I look at my notes that, um, and I think I was pretty consistent in my notes that this is um, one where I probably would have chiseled the change of charge a little bit, but I've already ignored my note on a, a previous vote that we had. Um, I, I, do con I am concerned just as um, board member Holmes expressed her concern about um, the rates for southwestern Vermont that um, sometimes I think uh, it would be better if increases and in change in charges better lined up with um, our goals of trying to hold um, health care growth to the growth of the overall economy. But it, it's such a small amount that um, I do support this motion. Before I open it up to uh, public comment, is there any further comment from board members? Then I will open it up to public comment. Would any member of the public wish to comment on the motion to approve North Country Hospital's budget as submitted? Hearing none, before we vote, I just want to say that um, um, kudos to Brian Nall for coming in um, and really uh, acclimating himself to uh, this hospital service area. And um, I think that the day's cash on hand and um, the help that they receive from the federal government um, puts them on, on pretty good footing. And it's always a hospital that you would truly worry about because of their um, lack of drivable proximity to other um, areas for care. So um, with that, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed to the motion signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion to approve North Country Hospital's budget as submitted was approved unanimously. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next up, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital, North Country's counterpart in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, <clears throat> this is a hospital, again, who has used um, continued and growing collaboration to provide needed services in rural Northeastern Vermont. Again, teaming up with area hospitals, as we heard from 
um, the North Country presentation. Um, in February, they were operating about 2% below budget. Um, at that time, they had lost their ophthalmologists, which was having an impact on their overall uh, revenues. <clears throat> their request at 3.7% is just over the 3.5% uh, growth rate ceiling set forth by the board with a total change in charge of 3.9%. Um, they have a 1.1% COVID-related change in charge um, in NPR. Um, if they did not have this, their growth in NPR would be 3.3% budget to budget. Um, Lori, if you could navigate to the operating margin page, please. Uh, again, this is a hospital that is coming in uh, with a budgeted margin at 2%. That is very, very close to what they um, have achieved historically. Um, this year, they are projecting to obviously miss that piece of their um, financial goals. <clears throat> However, um, overall, their change in charge is almost on point. Their request with COVID is almost on point with um, their historical averages for change in charge. So at 3.6%, I should note. Um, <clears throat> and with that, we would approve both as submitted the 3.7% requested growth and the uh, change in charge with the 1.1% COVID component um, as a part of that. Before we, we start, before we start to uh, talk about this motion, I think that uh, I have been lapsed, um, Patrick, in that um, you had a slide that had all the standard budget conditions. We have not referenced that at that point, and I think it might be important for us to reference that slide and make a motion to have it apply to all the budgets that we've approved so far and then reference it on each of the motions going forward. Certainly, yes, uh, we put this in there um, on the advice of our legal team. It is often um, cited, the standard budget order condition, so we decided that we would put this in the slide deck um, for reference in the motion. Um, <clears throat> and I believe, you want me to read through each one of these for recognition purposes for the record or? Well, you have in the past. There was one change that we made. Was that has that change been reflected on here? Yeah, that was the the. Um, was, oh, Lori, was that the timely filing of all provider? Nope, that was the hospital shall continue to file all requested data and other information in a timely and accurate manner. Um, before this, we had it in each um, recommendation as an additional recommendation. But to your point, Kevin, a couple of meetings ago. There's not a time in the future where we're not going to want or need um, monthly data from these hospitals to analyze, um, just given the, the situation on the ground in our state. So we put that in as a standard budget order condition that would be referenced in each single um, motion that the board makes. And clearly an important piece of each one of these is the sustainability planning, so that that's part of everyone's order. So um, is there discussion by the board on the standard budget order conditions? And the only thing I note is I, I know there was a reference to the standard budget order conditions in the Gifford motion. Uh, I mean, redundancy is not going to be a problem, but uh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I know I know it was in the Gifford one. I think I it's just want to make sure that everything is covered, so. Would somebody like to make a motion? I move that we approve the items on slide 27 as standard budget order conditions to be included in every hospital's budget order. Second. That's perfect. Then we don't have to bring it back up again. So um, that that is um, prospective as well as retrospective, correct? Member Lunch? Per correct. Thank you. <laughs> And it's been seconded by member Holmes. Is there discussion by the board? If not, I will open it up to public comment on a vote on the motion um, to approve the standard budget order conditions for each of the hospitals. Is there any public comment? I think I saw a hand flash for a second, but it disappeared. 
Hi, Kevin. This is Mark. Um, to the last item on the sustainability planning, um, I just want to reiterate the hospital's stance on the amount of effort and the amount of administrative work that needs to go into that item. And, you know, refer to, well, the Voss letter that they previously submitted to the board. Let the record so no. Is there other public comment? Mark, was it your hand that had gone up quickly and then went back down or? E e e yes, it was, Kevin. I actually thought I raised my hand, then you slapped it down. <laughs> <laughs> I would I'm never sorry. do that. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Yes, I have it too was. much respect for you. <laughs> okay. I <would> never do that. <laughs> so Any just other so you flip? know, go ahead. We we have these on our slides for the motions. Like Tom said, um, on 27, Southwestern on slide 39. So we made a point of making sure that that budget condition language referred to that slide. Okay, well, this will just clear up, clarify it for everyone. Right. <clears throat> Any other public comment? Any further board discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion to approve the standard budget condition signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show it was a unanimous vote. Patrick. OK, um, pick up where we left off with Northeastern. Um, our recommendation to approve the NPR increase at 3.7% and the change in charge at 3.9%, which is inclusive of the 1.1% COVID rate. And we would turn it over to the board for discussion on the Northwest or Northeastern Vermont hospital. Discussion on Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. Board members. So this is Robin. I will jump in because this may throw a wrench in the monkey works. So I'll do it early. Um, but I'd be interested in other people's perspective. So it looks like Northeastern is one of the hospitals that asked for the COVID increase uh, of 1%, which looks like it's about three, according to their 1% of charge is around 375,000, it looks like from my notes. Um, and they are also one of the hospitals that did not apply for the AHS funding. So, um, but they did in my notes that indicates that they applied for FEMA. So it seems like they would at least be eligible for that 25% match of their FEMA. Um, however much that is. Um, so I, I think for me personally, if there's the ability to get federal funding to support those COVID expenses, that would be my preference. But I, I also would want to um, hear from other folks on the board and others as to whether or not their COVID change in charge was meant to represent some other time period or something like that, even though I think our guidance was for 2020 expenses. Do we have a representative from North Northeast uh, on this call? Yes, it's Bob Hersey. Hey, Bob. Could you address so, that? The answer, I can, right. So the money that's available from FEMA and others goes away when the public emergency goes away. And we're expecting that to go away before we have to incur these expenses. So we won't be eligible. The money we're asking for or showing as COVID related charge increase is going to be incurred after the eligibility period for FEMA and other funds ends. Bob, am I correct if I recall your testimony at hearing um, Weren't you talking about these funds being used for changes that are going to have to occur and continue to occur in 21 as far as 
patient care with screening and PPE and things like that. It, it, exactly am I right. wrong? Okay. No, nope, you're absolutely right. No, it's the PPE, the screening, and the um, the sentries at the front entrance to um, screen uh, visitors. Yes, yeah. and, and the testing tent. We're going to have a testing location outside of the hospital that we have to staff as well. And again, those expenses are going to go on after the availability of FEMA or the AHA fund period ends. And were you able to apply for FEMA funds, Bob? Uh, we are um, of the opinion right now that we've gotten more already in, in state and, local and federal support than we're, going to, than we're going to be able to justify by the increased costs during this fiscal year and during the public emergency period. So words, I take we're in a similar situation. Similar situation. Uh, we did not apply because right now we're thinking we're going to have to pay money back as it is. So if we apply for FEMA, we're just going to have to pay more money back. Right. I just, Robin had uh, um, thought that you had mentioned that you were applying for FEMA, in which case it would probably would have been 25% that would have been eligible for the state dollars. But that not being the case, Robin, did you have further questions for, for Bob while he's on the line? Nope, that answered my question. Thank you. Sure. And thank you for being on the line, Bob. We appreciate that. Sure. Yep. Other board members. I guess I would just say, just in light of that conversation, I really appreciated that Northeastern uh, pulled out that 1.1% of their 2021, fiscal year 2021, expected COVID related charges because that would um, presumably, assuming we get through this pandemic at the end of 2021, those costs would sunset. And so it wouldn't be baked in the base of the commercial rate or the charge going forward. So I really appreciated that. And I, um, I appreciated your answer to that, Bob, that question. Sure, you're welcome. So I actually support, I'll just say I support the, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say I support the staff's recommendation on this, on this budget. And like member Holmes, I also, uh, am very deeply appreciative that, uh, that you did um, put in that request. And I have to believe in my heart of hearts that all hospitals have had to change their practices and will have screening and PPE expenses that will go into uh, 21. And I wish that more had taken advantage of that um, bifurcated rate, um, but that's hindsight. And uh, um, with that being said, I support um, the staff recommendation for Northeastern. Other board members? Yeah, I yeah, support I, it as well. And also want to echo that I appreciated that they separated out the COVID um, piece, the 1.1. And I supported it well as well. It seems that uh, Northeastern is on a good path in terms of co competing with its neighbors at North Country um, in Littleton. Um, their provider tax calculation was exactly at 6%. I applaud that, and uh, I can support the motion. Shall I make a motion? That would be good. Okay. Uh, I move we approve Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospitals budget as submitted with a 3.7% increase from fiscal year 20 to 21 budget at NPR a 2.8 standard increase to overall charges, a 1.1% COVID-19 related increase to overall charges and subject to our standard budget conditions as we've already approved. A second. Is there a second? I hear a second from member Holmes. It's been moved and seconded. Is there um, further board discussion? Hearing none, I'll open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the motion to approve Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital's budget as submitted? Hearing none, I'll throw it back to the board for any additional comment or question. And hearing none, all those who support the motion to approve uh, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital's budget as submitted signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the uh, motion carried unanimously. Patrick. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next up is Grace Cottage Hospital. <clears throat> their budget as submitted represents a 5.3% increase over their fiscal year 20 budget, which is in excess of the 3.5% growth ceiling. And they submitted a 3.2% change in charge. Um, as of February, Grace is operating about 6.8% below budget. Um, we looked back at historical growth, which has averaged about 4% annually. And in looking at that, we believe that yes, there has been a history of aspirational budgeting as the board puts it. However, we also consider that um, all budgets aspire to be actual at some point. So we look back at an average uh, growth rate of about 4% over these years represented on slide 54. And so <clears throat> we don't believe that uh, volume will solely contribute to their MPR request as the hospital cited. I think there's some um, demographic changes that they were thinking were going to drive their volume. Certainly COVID is gonna upend um, some of the demographics in this country, but that is yet to be borne out. And if that's the truth, we would expect to see that in the years to come, but probably not this year. Um, therefore, Lori, if you can navigate to the um, <clears throat> Uh, motion link, thank you. Also, um, looking back there, they are budgeting for essentially a break, even year operationally. Um, so due to that, uh, because of that, <clears throat> the logic that I've just expressed, we would reduce their NPR FPP budgeted growth to reflect that average year over year growth of 4% from 15 to 19, and we would approve their change in charge as submitted. And of course, um, built into that uh, reduction in NPR would be commensurate reductions to their operating expenses. And with that, we would turn it over to the board for discussion. So board members, question for Patrick or comments on Grace Cottage Hospital's budget? Well, this um, is one, go ahead. Cool. Um, yeah, I have an issue with their uh, the NPR requests that we're coming out with. Um, going back to um, what they had requested, um, yeah, looking at this chart here, the issue I have is um, they, they miss their budget um, every year. And um, one of the things that we had brought into guidance before was that if a hospital um, was missing their budget, that we would go no higher than 5% off of their projection um, and not the 3.5%. So when I look at what we approved from 19 to 20, we gave them the 3.5% um, increase year over year. If I go back and calculate from the 18,735 that they did in 19, a 5% increase, and then take a 3.5% increase on top of that, that would get them to about a 20.4 million versus the 21 million. Um, it's also important to note that, as Patrick said, through February, they were 7% behind their projection. Um, and um, if we do recall last year, we did make them bring it down somewhat from their budget and they were opposed to that adjustment. Um, and they still came, were coming in 7% short of that. So if I took their 7% decline that they were trending at, look at that up there on their 20 projection and then carry that forward by 1.035, that would, bring them to 20.2 million. Um, so I do not support giving them over three and a half percent increase um, for their NPR. And if anything, I would talk about should we reduce it to 2%. And, and I just want to really um, express the rationale is because this hospital has consistently missed their top line every single year. And, they're ex and they lose money every year because their expenses are tied to that top line budget. So I do not want them to pull back and not do anything or refuse services, but I just don't see that they're gonna hit the top line number. I'm okay with the change in charge of the 3.2, um, but again, I, I don't support 
I certainly don't support going to 4%. Uh, we could talk about whether it should be 3.5%. Um, personally, I think it should be a 2% increase because of uh, their misses in the prior years and because of our prior guidance of saying you could be 5% off of your projection. So Maureen, I would support if you went down to the 3.5 because clearly that was the uh, guidance. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about going too much below that only because Grace Cottage uh, reported um, stronger numbers once the pandemic um, hit than other hospitals. What, the, what they noticed in their area was that um, because of their location, there were a, a lot of second homeowners that came in and through whatever, had twisted ankles or things like that. Um, they did not see the drop in, in revenue as much. And part of that is because really it's different than most hospitals. Yes, it has an ER, but um, you know, it's it's more or less a large medical practice. It's our smallest uh, hospital in the state, and in some respects, I I think small is nice in that respect. I also have always felt bad for Grace Cottage being the hospital that pays into provider taxes but doesn't receive anything back. But but I do believe strongly they did not make a case to exceed the guidance of the 3.5. So. I would be with you on that, but probably not with you on two. Um, other board members? Yeah, I share Maureen's concern. I, I note that in their budget that um, for 2021, they were using, uh, it was like $882,000 in kind of carry forward um, uh, COVID money. And I just worry given the growth in spending that they are going to hit a cliff at the end of 2021. They they do have some additional federal money and it's quite a bit of money, uh, at least uh, um, I think it's like $3 million of COVID money at the end of 2021, but they're unsure whether or not they can justify keeping that. And so it's, you know, it's like other hospitals subject to an audit. They also have a, a, a very old age of um, age of plan at 18.8 years. So I would like to pair down. Um, I can agree that pairing down um, to kind of soften the landing from uh, the federal money to a, a lower NPR growth rate. I'd also be open to increasing the change in charge, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, by, you know, a percent or so to kind of, you know, have those those uh, uh, you know the the um, the loss of the federal money to have some support on, on underneath them, but uh, um, <clears throat> so that so I you know I, I could support um, you know lowering the NPR and increasing the change in charge. It's such a small hospital; it's not going to make or break the system. And uh, small is beautiful, I think, uh, to some extent in Townsend. So I'll hop in there. Go ahead, Jess. Oh, okay. I was gonna say that I um, I also support reducing the NPR probably closer to three and a half, um, maybe not so far down as two. But when I look at it, I do think this is an aspirational budget. And I appreciate that the hospital budget team looked at the 4% actual growth from 15 to 19, but 15 to 16 was the big year of growth for this hospital. If you if you start from 16 and you look up 16, 17, 18, 19, they're averaging much lower average growth rates. So the more recent trends have been closer to 3% or sometimes you know less than that uh, growth rate. So I would be comfortable with a three and a half, even maybe slightly lower than that. Uh, but uh, you know, certainly I'm not comfortable with four. I think that's aspirational. And for the same reasons that Maureen outlined, this hospital has not, their expenses have exceeded their uh, NPR year after year, their operating margins have been negative. You know, I think their expenses have to be in line with what they're actually going to receive in terms of revenue. Um, and so I think this might be the year to help them on that path. This is Robin. I'm. Whoops, go ahead. Robin. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I'm. Uh, 
I, I'm on board as well with reducing the NPR. Um, and uh, I'm comfortable with the three and a half percent guidance amount. Um, and I guess that's really all I have to say. Yeah, and I mean, I can um, I, I can agree to the three and a half percent because we didn't put in the budget guidance this year, the five percent, you know, to based on um, projections. But um, I don't think they're going to hit. Uh, so I mean, it's just a caution to the hospitals because your expenses are rising significantly, um, up a million and a half or up a million seven from a 22.2 million budget in 20 to 22.8 million, so sorry, up 700,000. Uh, um, that, you know, it, it definitely could create an issue of continued loss. And, you know, just one thing on the 4% year over year, that's on the actuals. And we're now putting a 4% to their budget, which they miss the budget every year. So that's why I, I don't agree with the 4%, because on an actual to actual basis, obviously they've gone up 4%, but I would then go back to their actuals for 2019 and hit them up 4% and then 4%. It, it comes up to a much lower number um, when you look at it to budget. But I'll, I can go ahead with the three and a half. Um, I don't think, uh, a change and an increase in change in charge. Um, and, and the other thing, Tom, remember on this hospital, they have uh, the payer mix where they really don't have a lot in commercial. They have much less in commercial payers. And that's one reason, um, you know, that those increases haven't generated a lot. So, yeah, it was 34%. Maureen, would you like to make a motion? Sure. Uh, move to approve Grace Cottage Hospital budget with an NPR FPP increase of three and a half percent from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21 budget with commensurate reduction to expenses, uh, 3.2 percent increase to overall charges as submitted and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 27. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by member Lunge. Further board discussion? So um, I'd like to amend the motion. Um, uh, I'm looking at their change in charge history and on average it's been 4.3% uh, over the last uh, five years. Uh, like the hospital that we talked to uh, about earlier, the 5.8% is the one in 2016 and that falls off the table. And uh, I fully understand what Marine is saying is that when you look at the, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the distribution, um, you know, a 3.2% change in charge yields only a couple hundred thousand dollars in commercial. But I think for a hospital like this, every bit counts. And I, I think that they put themselves, you know, out in a position of depending on this federal carry forward money too much. And um, so I'd like to amend the motion to include a 4.3% change in charge, which is their um, long term history. Is there a second to the uh, the amendment? Hearing none, unfortunately, Tom, your motion to amend fails. Won't be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'll open it up to the uh, public comment on the motion that uh, is before us, which is to approve Grace Cottage Hospital's budget with an NPR FPP increase of 3.5% from FY20 to FY21 budget with a commensurate reduction to expenses, a 3.2% increase in overall charges that submitted and subject to the standard conditions. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. 
let the record show that the motion has carried unanimously. And as I'm watching the clock, Patrick, I notice it's 425. Is this the logical time to stop for today and commence tomorrow at 830? Yes, I would yeah. say it is. Yeah. And do I have that time correct, 830 tomorrow? I believe so. Yes. Great. So with that, um, is there a motion to adjourn for the day? Kevin, um, before we adjourn, can uh, we have any insight as to what the next couple of hospitals might be for tomorrow? I think all the remaining hospitals are what you should be prepared for tomorrow, every okay. single one. It's an all-day board meeting, and uh, whatever possibly can be accomplished tomorrow should be accomplished tomorrow. Got it. Is there a motion to adjourn today's meeting? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn our meeting. I'll see everybody tomorrow at uh, 8.30. Don't I haven't to forgotten to call the motion. I haven't forgotten to call it. I'm just right. reminding everybody before I do, Jess, that um, we'll, we'll be back again at 8.30. So with that, all those in favor of the motion to adjourn signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Let the record show the motion was unanimous. See everybody tomorrow at 8.30. Thank you, everyone.